Good morning, UNU RCEs across the world. So I'd like to go over some of uh, some introductions and our objectives for today, and then we'll go over the rules of engagement. So if I could have your attention, please. Uh, welcome to the first annual Youth Virtual Conference of the UNURCEs, Sustainable Water. Uh, my name is Ryan Huppert. I'll be moderating today, so I'll explain uh, some of our objectives. As you can see on the slide, this conference seeks to give students the perspective and practice of a global dialogue in hopes that they will better understand the unique water dilemmas facing the regions of the world and in turn reveal and embrace the universal themes of sustainable evolution through dialogue, empathy, and collaboration. So some of our rules of engagement. I want to remind people that only one microphone and one audio speaker per room. Multiple presenters will share the single microphone. When not presenting, please mute your microphone. Again, when you are not presenting, please mute your microphone. I think they heard me. Encourage and assist your students to pose rich questions. Questions will be posed at each site by allowing one student at a time to ask a question through the microphone directly to the presenting group. So that will be in front of the microphone and in front of the camera. That should be in English. If that student is not comfortable asking the question in English, uh, please allow for interpretation uh, so that student's question can be asked. The order of questions will go as follows. After we will follow the conference schedule for the qu schedule of questions. So for example, Grand Rapids is the first group to present on the schedule. Next after us is Medellin, Colombia. So Medellin, you will have the first opportunity to pose a question and so on and so forth. After Medellin is Curitiba, Brazil, and we will follow uh, that order until the five minutes of questions and answers are up. If we could go to the time zone chart, please. So as you guys can see, we have Saskatchewan, Canada online at Luther College. It's 7 in the morning there. Thank you so much for coming in early. We appreciate that. Here in Grand Rapids, it's 9 in the morning. Medellin, Colombia and Lima, Peru, it is 8 in the morning. In Kirkrade in the Netherlands, it's already 3 in the afternoon. So as we're starting our school day, they are ending there simultaneously. Uh, in Curitiba, Brazil, it is 10 in the morning. If we could go over the conference schedule. So as you will see, session one will be presented by Grand Rapids. Approximately nine to 10 minutes of presentation time with five minutes for questions and answers. We will have a technology reset, which should just take a minute or two. And then Medellin, Colombia will be presenting. After each session, this is a reminder that after each session, the questions and answers will go in the order of the conference schedule, okay? So once we are done, I will prompt Medellin for any questions, and then we will wait to see what they have to ask. If there are no questions, we'll move on to Curitiba, Brazil, and so on and so forth until the five minutes is up. If your presentation is longer than 10 minutes, uh, we may use up some of the question and answer time. That's fine. Uh, we do have one group who has not logged in, and that is Lima, Peru. Lima is last on the schedule, so if Lima does not log in, uh, we will go over into their time, but uh, we will look for them, and if they log on, we will certainly uh, be excited to hear what they have to say. So without any further ado, I think we will uh, welcome Grand Rapids, Michigan, the students from City High Middle and the Center for Economicology onto the stage. Please uh, join me on stage. Elena McKendrick, Victoria Mason, Thomas DeBoer, and Olivia Harrington. Okay, well, I'll turn the mic over to Elena and they will be presenting to us today 
think we have to go back one slide. There we are, quagga mussels in the Great Lakes. Thank you very much. Hello, my name is Lena McKendrick, and we are students at City High Middle School. This is Thomas DeVore, Olivia Harrington, and Victoria Mason, and we are here to talk to you today about quagga mussels and the Great Lakes and what we have done to address the problems they pose to our local watershed. All right, so the scientific name for the quagga mussels is the Drysena bugenis rostiformis. They're a subspecies of the freshwater mussel. They live from three to five years and are 0.8 inches wide. And in appearance, they are striped and asymmetrical, which in the picture, they're on the right side compared to a zebra mussel. And they're also filter feeders, so they take in over a liter of water per day, and they take out all the zooplankton and phytoplankton and the algae and use it for their own nutrient needs, which causes a problem for the environment because it takes out the stuff that the water needs and the animals in the water need. So they are an invasive species as well. So how did they get here? Well, they were introduced uh, into the Great Lakes in the late uh, 1980s. They came from the Caspian Sea, from the ocean freighters, and through the Atlantic and up the St. Lawrence River, and came down into the Great Lakes. And they're now spreading down through the Mississippi and into the neighboring lakes and rivers, which is causing problems throughout the entire country. So what they're doing here in the Great Lakes is actually they're extremely invasive species and they're posing a lot of problems in our local community. And so what they do is since they're filter feeders, they take out things like Victoria said, the phytoplankton, zooplankton, other scavengers and decomposers in the area, and they filter them out and excrete what they don't need. And so as they're taking out all this nutrients and bacteria from the bottom of the lake, they're actually reducing the food supply for a lot of the small prey in the area and smaller fish. And so as they're taking out the food supply in the area, that's causing the small fish, small fish population to severely drop, which then causes the larger fish population to drop and then the bird population to drop. So really, by taking out just the bottom part of the food chain, the bacteria and decomposers in the area, they're allowing for the populations of all organisms all the way up the food chain to have a lot of different problems in the area. Also, as they are taking out all the phytoplankton and zooplankton, they're allowing for the sun to penetrate deeper and deeper into the water. For without as much bacteria in the water, that's the lake is much more clear. And so as you can see in this diagram, you can see that in the one side where there are no quag mussels or very few quag mussels, that there's a lot more bacteria in the water, which means it's much more rich and the sun can get penetrated as farther down. But as the quagga mussels are there, they're taking out all the bacteria and all the decomposers, and they're allowing the sun, the sun to go deeper and deeper into the water. And as this happens, it's allowing for many different types of algae to actually bloom and grow much more quickly and get much bigger at the bottom of the lake. And in Lake Michigan, there's a certain type of algae called cladrophora. And this type of algae, when it, uh, it blooms and blossoms, it has the potential to actually excrete type E botulism and E. coli into the area. And so as it is introducing these bacteria into the area and E. coli and botulism, it's getting into the local fish and the birds and getting them sick and even more dropping their population. So it's really causing many widespread problems throughout the entire food web to our local watershed. Um, so what we're doing to help, well, first of all, we teamed up with um, the Adaptive Beach program and Groundswell and we also uh, teamed up with the Grand Valley Water Resource Institute and we conducted a little bit of citizen science um, where just members of the community go out and do um, simple science. So we went to the Grand Haven State Park Beach and we took water samples and we monitored and cleaned up the litter in the area. We checked for quagga mussels and we did some E. coli testing and after that we talked to the local DNR to find out more about the health of the lake and the effect of the quagga mussels on the Great Lakes. Um, we were going to have a video that we took while we were there, but um, we didn't get it uploaded in time. So it just showed us um, taking E. coli and coliform tests and we, uh, us cleaning and quantifying the trash that was in the area. And while we were there, we also took water samples and quagga mussel samples and did some more um, general health monitoring. All right, so what we found at the beach was that our local beach, the Grand Haven State Park Beach, is actually in really great health. We found very few quagga mussels, which is really great, and there was also very limited, very limited pollution and litter in the area, so that was great, which means our local beach is actually really keeping up on 
keeping it clean, which is very important to the ecosystem. And when we took our coliform and E. coli test, there was virtually no E. coli in the readings, which as, which as they are a potential indicator for coagul mussels in the area, it then again shows that there really are very few coagul mussels in the area. And so as we found this out, we realized how important it is for us to keep doing this so that we can keep our lake so clean and keep our lake free of invasive species such as the quag mussels for it will just really help our ecosystem grow and flourish and it, keeping it clean is very important to our community and we can hopefully keep it in this such a great state. And when we have this information, we are we have this all this data and we're sending it back to the Grand Valley Water Resources Institute and the Adopted Beach Program and we are giving it back to them and they'll be able to see the data we found. They're going to be able to see what we can tell the beach in order for them to keep it more clean and able to keep it in better health and after sending it to the scientists at Grand Valley State University they can look at it and see what changes have potentially been made in the lake over the past few years and how the quagga mussels have maybe impacted the area. And so as we give them these, this data, they can really find out what they need to do to safely eradicate the quagga mussels from, from the area or just at least stop the spread. So yeah, here's Thomas. All right. So this is a satellite image of Michigan where we live and um, all the lakes surrounding um, Michigan are the Great Lakes and they make up about 20% of the world's surface freshwater so it's really important to like maintain these and keep them clean so that we can use all of the fresh water that we need. Um, the, our local watershed in Grand Rapids is the Grand River which flows into Lake Michigan. And um, the reason why it's important for us to keep the quagga mussels in check in Lake Michigan is because they can get into our river and go upstream and that'll cause a lot of problems for our local watershed so we have to keep it contained in Lake Michigan as well. All right, so as I said earlier, what our research can do is it can really just help improve the area and really help improve the health of the lake. And as we give it to the institutes that we teamed up with, like Groundswell and Grand Valley State University Water Resources Institute, they can really take a look at the changes and we can really make a difference with the data that we've been given and the data we found at the beach. With it, we can aid research on the effect of quagga mussels and how to safely eradicate them from the region. So it's really important that we keep doing this and help finding out what the quagga mussels are really doing so we can make a bigger difference and help keep our beaches clean and safe from invasive species such as the quagga mussels. All right, so what we'd really like to leave you guys with is that the invasion of the quagga mussels is a relatively recent occurrence. So since it was so recent, we have yet to fully understand the ecological impacts of the quagga mussels on our Great Lakes. And so as we are just still learning about them, we really just need more community members and more citizens to help out and help give us this data that the scientists in our area need to safely eradicate them or stop the spread of quagga mussels. And so what we really need is just more citizens doing citizen science, just like we did, going out to the beach, taking some samples, working with some local community partners, and we can really make a huge difference and really learn a lot about these quag mussels and how to safely eradicate them from the Great Lakes and keep our beaches clean and healthy. Thank you. Wonderful job, very good job, City High Middle. We have time for questions. Uh, Medellin is next on the schedule, so Medellin will be first up for questions. I see there's a few in the chat box, but if Medellin uh, has any questions, we will turn it over to Medellin. Do you guys uh, have any questions? If so, please turn on your microphone and pose your question. If the situation continues as current, how much of an impact does it have on bilateral trade between the United States and Canada, as it must affect navigability in the Great Lakes. So the quagga mussels really do have a huge impact, not only here in the Great Lakes, but globally. And as they moved up the St. Lawrence River, that means that they spread to the rivers surrounding the St. Lawrence River, which all go and are connected to Canada. And so as they tend to move upstream and downstream, they really could be a potential threat for many rivers and lakes in Canada. 
And so we really would like to um, keep this data running and keep this research so we could figure out maybe if they have had a large impact on Canada and what we can do to help not only our local Great Lakes but globally and in Canada and in any other places where the quag mussels are having an impact as well. Wonderful. Thank you, Medellin. Great question. How about Curitiba, Brazil? Do you guys have any questions? If so, please turn on your microphone and pose your question. Hi. I would like to know, is there any kind of plan or program that you'd like to uh, promote the local biodiversity of your lake and your water? Could you repose the question? Thank you. Um, do you have any program or plan that you use uh, to show the biodiversity to your population? Yeah, the Adopted Beach program that we actually worked with to help figure out what was going on in our beach and to find out the data actually is partnering with beaches around the country, around all around the U.S. and not just here in Grand Rapids. So all you have to do is go online and register on their site and you can start a beach cleanup. And after you've done your beach cleanup, you send your information back to the Adopted Beach Foundation and you can look at it online and see all different beaches all across the U.S. and see what's going on there, all the biodiversity, any problems that are being posed in any part of the U.S. And so that's one program that we specifically worked with that really helped us see the biodiversity in not only our Great Lakes region, but around the U.S. to see what was really going on around watersheds all around the country. Thank you, Curitiba. Uh, Kirkrade, Kirkrade, do you have any questions in the Netherlands? If so, please turn on your microphone and pose your question. I don't know if you have questions. Questions I need to ask. Do you have any questions? No. 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 Currently, we don't have questions. Okay, thank you. Yep, thank you. Let's see. Uh, Saskatchewan, I see that you did pose a question. Would you like to read your question? Thank you. Uh, hi. I was just wondering if there's any positive impact of the quagga muscles in the Great Lakes. I think specifically with solving the problem of eutrophication. Thank you. Was your question uh, the same one that's posted in the chat about positive impacts? Yes. Okay. So he's asking if there's positive impacts. Yeah. So you can speak to like, you know, Lake Erie. All right. So in Lake Michigan, most of the impacts are actually quite negative. But in other Great Lakes, such as Lake Erie, they actually have had a positive impact because in lakes such as Lake Erie, it was actually a very dirty lake. It had too much bacteria, which was too much for the local fish in the area to have. And so when the coagula mussels were introduced into Lake Erie in that area, they were able to filter out a lot of the excess bacteria and anything they didn't need in the area. So in Lake Erie, and specifically Lake Erie, it was able to really help out the ecosystem, help filter it out, so that lake actually became much more healthy. But in most places that the quag mussels come into, they do have largely negative impacts, but there are a few cases where they're able to help clean out a lake, such as like in Lake Erie. Great, thank you, Saskatchewan, great question. Okay, uh, at this point, if we, we have time for one or two more questions for Grand Rapids, if anyone would like to pose, uh, Let's hear from our group in Grand Rapids. We have a live audience here. Is there anybody in the live audience in Grand Rapids who would like to pose a question of our students here? Oh, come on, guys. There's got to be someone. Great. Come on up, Miles. And then if you just want to come on here, and then you can turn and face them and ask them, that'd be great. Just make sure that they're heard in the microphone. Um, so I was just wondering how long you think it will take before there is a lot of concrete evidence um, of the long-term effects in a larger scale than just Lake Michigan. So how long do you think it'll be until you can see this growth negatively impact everyone to an extreme level? So 
As the Kwang mussels move up and downstream, they're actually moving down the Mississippi River, so they are impacting so many more areas, which allows for more and more scientists and more and more researchers to look into the problem of quagga mussels as they're invading more and more watersheds. And so as they're impacting more and more areas, we're able to get more and more data and more and more research. And that's really all we need to find out more about them. So as long as they're around, we can always keep looking at them and always keep studying them. And with that, it really shouldn't take too long, maybe 10 years, to really figure out a really safe way to eradicate them. We've already started coming up with different ways, such as monitoring the oxygen levels and maybe decreasing it to try and get the quag mussels out. And so it's already only been just a couple, just a couple years, just a couple decades, where we've been able to look at them and study them, and we're already coming up with ways to eradicate them. And so it really shouldn't be too long before we can really have enough research and enough evidence to really know what we need to do to safely eradicate them from any watershed. Great. Okay. Okay, Grand Rapids, your time for questions and answers is up. Let's give them a round of applause. Yeah, go ahead. Okay, so next on the agenda, we are going to be going to Medellin, Colombia. Uh, Medellin, we will be, technology will be reset so that you guys will be in control of the slides on your presentation. And uh, we look forward to hearing what you have to say. So, Colegio Manasori in Medellin, Colombia. Hello, we're the Monterrey School from Medellin, Colombia, and we're going to talk about the problems that surround the Magdalena River and the possible solutions. Colombia, officially the Republic of Colombia, is a unitary constitutional republic comprising 32 departments from 1,102 municipalities. It is located in the, eastern, in the northwestern part of South America, bordered by Venezuela, the Pacific Ocean, Panama, the Atlantic Ocean, Ecuador, Brazil, and Peru. The official language is Spanish, even though it has 68 ethnic dialects recognized. It is a very rich country in terms of hydrographic centers. The most important one is the Colombian Massif, located in the Cordillera Central de los Andes in the Department of Cauca. It is a source to four of the most important Colombian rivers, Magdalena, Cauca, Patia, and Caquetá. The Magdalena River is the most important water course in Colombia, and it covers almost all of the 24% of the Colombian territory. It passes through almost every ecosystem. It is surrounded by some villages that use it daily for some activities like taking resources away from transportation or economical issues. It also gives home to thousands of species of fauna and flora, but we are going to focus on the part of the river that passes through Antioquia. It passes through the eastern part of the department. This area is called with Magdalena and touches three of the municipalities of Antioquia, called Puerto Rio, Arranca Bermeja, and Puerto Salgado. There, the river is very important in terms of mining and tourism in the part of Rio Claro. Now we're going to, we're going to talk about the socio-cultural phase of the situation. Because of the length of the river, we find a it is divided in three areas, Mid Magdalena, Lo Magdalena, and High Magdalena. But we will be focused on the Mid Magdalena area. Surrounding this area, we find a really high concentration of population, which includes 84.5% uh, of mestizos who are European descendants, 15% uh, of Afro Colombians, and finally, a 0.5% of natives who are a significant minority. The Asian everywhere have a typical way of dressing and eating, and also have a special way of spending free time with families, uh, such as the traditional festivals and celebrations. The principal economical activities of the area are the exploitation of forest and mineral resources, uh, livestock, agricultural production, and fishing. Fishing is one of the most important traditional activities of the area, and it is the principal economical sustain they have, and it is also a really important product for the daily nutrition. The most significant environmental problem economic activities will present is that at first people just use those activities for daily maintenance, but nowadays they are becoming more ambitious and are over exploiting resources. Um, in the last 20 years, the river pollution has increased in a 70% due to illegal uh, activities uh, in the river. But nowadays, Colombian government are implementing police centers that provide protection to the communities. 
Also, the violence is an important issue because it is creating displacement of community, um, also is injury all the communities of the surrounding. The Colombian government is controlling also the illegal activities performed in the area by illegal fishing or illegal mining. Thank you. As more than 30 million Colombians live throughout the basin, it has a huge economic impact on the economy. It affects 85% of gross domestic products, which is more or less the same product of Egypt in a whole a year. It generates important jobs through food and protein production, and the major activity, which is mining. The river faces economic challenges that have to do with the constant diminishment of resources caused by deforestation, leaking of agriculture, soil erosion, and flooding. In order to solve these issues, which could seriously affect the whole economy of the country, the Colombian government has been investing more than 1.2 billion pesos in the recovery of the river's water and its navigation. It has as well implemented plans that stimulate and prohibit illegal mining, as well as fishing with dangerous components. In order to keep track of the status of the population changes which affect the river, the government has been strict in trying to control overpopulation. Finally, for the Republic of Colombia, this river represents an economic priority, and therefore it must be preserved for the well-being of, of Colombia's economic lifeline. The Magdalena River is housed to some 200 species, 55% of whom are endemic to this waterway. Sadly, a lot of them are threatened by many different reasons. The river's animals are mostly threatened, like in other parts of the world, by extensive poaching, overfishing, and deforestation for oil palm production. But recently, invasive species have become a threat to both the species and locals, especially hippopotamus brought from Africa by drug dealers in the 90s. These hippos escaped from the dealers' lands about five years ago and are established in the riverside. The hippos are destroying fragile ecosystems and uh, <clears throat> Are, and there have also been reported attacks against fishermen and locals that have thankfully not left any casualties. Nevertheless, the main threat to this river is pollution caused by the disposal of waste, burning of crops, and illegal mining. This awful form of exploitation pollutes the river with mercury and destroys the riverside ecosystems, sponsoring organized crime and corruption. The government has begun a strong offensive against this form of mining, helping the river's living organisms. But some legal mining activities like mining in the Sonzon Paramo, a unique ecosystem of Colombia, 3,000 meters above sea level, where most of the country's water is made, are affecting the river from its beginning when it's only a small stream. Okay, solutions. Economical solutions. Continue with the current processes and investments in the recovery of water for improved navigability. More strictly implement plans that require illegal miners to legalize their businesses by paying fines and affiliating their, their companies to the corresponding national entities. Implement a policy of strong regulation of investments in the infrastructure around the river to assure proper care of toxic and urban wastes and prevent overpopulation. Ecological solutions. Create plans to eradicate invading species. Take stronger actions against illegal mining. Decrease fund research programs to decrease pollution caused by mercury. Make policies against poaching and overfishing and begin reforestation programs. Social cultural solutions. There is an ecological authority in charge of maintaining the Magdalena River. Its recent plans are making a canal in order to achieve more proper conditions of the river and the navigation. It generates jobs and gives ecological sustainability. Prevents students and makes transportation easier. Our solution. We as students want to make people aware of what's going on in the river, not only with the Magdalena, but also with the affluent rivers. Starting with the youngest to the oldest students from our school and show them our information, and then with that, uh, show other schools and spread the word. Playing them with exact data and statistics for them to have more knowledge of what's really happening. And know how critical the situation is and will be. Also, let people know that there are some important species that can be taken away from their habitat. If they are taken away, there, there will be a, an extinction of wildlife.
Wonderful job, Medellin. Wonderful presentation. Thank you very, very much. Okay, at this time, uh, we will open it up for questions. First, to be able to pose a question is Curitiba, Brazil. So, Brazil, if you'd like to turn on your microphone and pose a question, uh, Medellin will respond directly. We have no questions. Thank you. Thank you. Kirkrade, do you have any questions for Medellin? Kirkrade. Yes, we have questions. Yes, we have seen some pictures of a flood. Do you also build dikes in your country or how do you arrange the water management? Use the word dike, right? Or dam. Uh, maybe while you're typing, uh, we could talk a little bit about uh, the dike system. In Medellin, I'm not sure if you're familiar with the dike systems of the Netherlands, but it refers to a type of uh, uh, dam or water control barrier. And uh, they're wondering if you utilize something similar to control water in your country. The question is now posed in the chat box. There are some special sites that have been built, been built on in the coastal region of the country, especially in major cities like in Cartagena and Barranquilla. Uh, these are very good uh, for sailing in the coastal regions, and some more have been begun to be built uh, in other parts of the country, but recent floodings have, have, been, have made very difficult the building of, of these dikes. Wonderful, very interesting, thank you. Sounds like we share, you guys share some of the same issues in your coastal regions. Uh, let's see, Saskatchewan, did you have a question that you'd like to pose? If so, turn on your microphone and pose the question. Uh, <clears throat> we have two questions. Uh, our first one is, what level of awareness is there within the general public about the problems in the river? Today, the Colombian population is pretty much aware of the problems in the Magdalena River, and the government has been implementing plans to educate people, especially those who live around the river and the surrounding major cities, to take care of the river and to control disposals and everything and what they throw into the river. There's a second question. Was the second question addressed? Yes. Currently, the river, the main investors in the river are foreigners, primarily Chinese, Dutch, Belgians, and some Americans and Canadian investors. They have a lot of investment in currently, and China has just inaugurated a new program in our river. They are running the, gov the plan with the government to, for, to the, for the recovery of the river and the navigability. Uh, yes. Thank you very much. Uh, let's see, we have some questions for you here in Grand Rapids. All right, so I'm wondering about the long-term effects on the river of the pollution and the drilling and everything. So like 10, 20 years from now, what do you think the state of the river will be? Okay, we posed our question in the chat box.
thanks to the recent plans established by the government of foreign investment, uh, the effects of the river will not be as serious as they, as they could have been if recent plans hadn't been put into action. Yes, there will be some problems regarding, for example, the pollution created by, uh, <clears throat> by mercury in the water and by the deforestation of, of the natural rainforest. But nevertheless, uh, the, the new programs will help treat people with infections of mercury and are helping the, uh, the repopulation of various areas that were losing uh, endemic species. So right now, the river is actually getting healthier than it was before. Very good question. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, at this time, uh, we'd like to thank you for your presentation. It was very well done. Uh, round of applause for Medellin. And at this time, we will be uh, switching to Curitiba, Paraná, Brazil. And uh, we await your presentation. You guys will now have control of the slides. And uh, we await your presentation. Okay, so first of all, good morning, and good morning to all RCs. My name is Raul, and I'm representing Curitiba. Next. Okay, so where exactly is Curitiba? Of course, we are in Brazil, South America, and as you can see in the green yellowish state highlighted, that is Paraná. Curitiba is actually the capital city of the state. Next. Where is Curitiba based on watersheds? Paraná has 12 different watersheds. We are in High Iguazu watershed. That it receives this name because it is in the beginning of the Iguazu River, which is the main river of this watershed that starts here in Curitiba and flows to generate the so famous Iguazu Falls. Next. Uh, everybody knows that Brazil is full and rich in water, and that's true, but not exactly here in Curitiba when it comes to groundwater. Although the aquifer Guarani, that is the biggest aquifer in South America, it's very close to Curitiba, it's, Curitiba is not on it. So we don't have to count a lot with this groundwater. Next. We are located on Guabirotuba geological formation that is formed on groundwater. So we go to rivers, surface water, to as a fount, as a resource of water for us. Next. So on this watershed, where Curitiba is, all the rivers there are on the sea. And as you can see in this map, there are a lot of rivers on the city. Uh, some are very important for us. Belém, Ivo, Iguaçu, Barigui, and Juvevê. Those rivers, they have a very important, very important role when it comes to early village establishment, especially Belém and Ivo River. Belém River was the first water resource from Curitiba, and Ivo was the first waste disposal place where people, like three centuries ago, throw everything. One interesting thing about this horse statue that represents the beginning of the village. Uh, Curitiba wasn't a destination city as it was a passing city. The travelers came, stacked some supplies, redraped themselves and their horses, and when the horses were being hydrated, they drew on the water of the fountain. So the, the state made a law that said that horses could not drink on the fountain at, before 6 p.m. So that this way, the people who can drink, who would get the water, wouldn't have to deal with the nasty drew. Next. Now going back to Iguazu River, that is the main river. Uh, in Curitiba, the, the river is very degraded. As you can see in the map, the the it's pointing rivers that flows to Iguazu. And that's the biggest problem, not exactly the Iguazu River being depleted, but all the other rivers that go to it are being depleted. Next. And this happens in many ways. 
One of it is waste from the river directly, domestic sewage, especially from buildings when you have a little construction in your house and you have a lot of waste that you don't know what to do and some people throw in the river, especially near the slums. And one big problem that we have here in the city of Curitiba is to supervise the small industries. They are legally registered, but their waste are not treated and they don't have that much supervision. Different from big companies. The big companies have a lot of supervision on how they should treat their waste before throwing on the river or whatever they will do with it. Next. And with that comes a lot of health issues associated. First of all, diseases in general, and also diseases related with heavy metal present on the river that will make a big problem on the whole food chain. Uh, and this is due especially because of those industries, waste that have a, contain a lot of heavy metals. And not only this kind of health, but also the emotional health that's being a little bit harm for people who have to work or live near those he rivers that they have a very strong and unpleasant smell. Next. And you may, you see that Curitiba is full of rivers and they say, okay, but how come it's so degraded? Because Curitiba is a big and very urbanized city. The population of the city nears two million and its metropolitan area is more than three million. So we have a lot of people, even though we have a lot of rivers. And all rivers in Curitiba are polluted. And you can see in the lower image of a park with a lake, uh, doesn't seem polluted, it seems like a beautiful river, but it, the, the waters are not good for consumption. And most of the rivers are, in Curitiba are covered or channeled. The, the younger inhabitants don't even know that the city has that many rivers. Next. So what should you do about it? Okay, we know that the rivers have a high potential of self declaration For example, Iguazu River, four or five cities before Curitiba has a clean, very good water, but that's not a reason, reason to continue polluting. One action that should be taken is intensify the inspections of industry waste, waste, especially those small industries that I talked before. And of course, correct disposal of domestic refuse. For example, recyclables should go to a place, organic to another, so they can have the right destination. Next. And of course, education. Education to society is very important when you talk about environmental and sustainability development and promote teachers' training in all levels, because even the person, the teacher, an educator, or even a professor, they may not know the real situation of the rivers and the environment at all, so they should be educated more and create some portals on the internet that the population can see what is the quality of rivers. They can know in the almost instant moment the situation of the river and of course promote some sustainability uh, events to increase the awareness of the population and most important communication because we can't save the earth by ourselves. One person is not enough so everybody should know about it and all the citizens could participate more actively in preservation, in this environmental preservation and doesn't focus on one only tracts of population, only the poor people or only the rich people. Everybody should get together so we can make a better environment. Next. One program that is being developed, developed here in Curitiba, especially on tech, technical University is from Professor Dr. Marcelo Ono, this website, cuisodosrios.echo.br, that talks about how is measured the quality of the rivers, what should you do with your waste, and other, and I recommend that you access this website, it's very interesting and you can know a little bit more about our rivers, and other projects that are being developed here is by Studio Bios Cities and Biodiversity, that is also held on Technical University, and Water to Life from Professor Tamara Van Kijk. And next. Thank you very much.
Thank you. Very nice job, wonderful presentation, thank you. Uh, let's see, first on the list for the asking of questions is Kirkrade. Kirkrade, do you have any questions that you would like to pose? If so, please turn on your microphone and pose the question. Yes, we have uh, two questions. The first is, uh, if nothing is done about the pollution, what would be the consequences within uh, approximately 15 years? And what would be the consequences on the biodiversity and the organisms living in the river? Uh, thank you. If you could type your question in as well, if we could also uh, type all questions in, I think that will help uh, to make sure the questions are heard correctly. Uh, Kuritiba, did you hear the question? I didn't hear, but there is a type of question. And Iguazu River does have a, oh my God, what? A treatment plant, of course, uh, in many levels that reduces the pollution, but not everything can be can be treated. It's, actually it's not saturated. enough. It's actually saturated of the thing that we produce more pollution than we can treat. Great question. Uh, Kirkrade, are you typing your question in? Okay, we will keep it. Please wait. Okay, Kirkrade has posed their question. Uh, Kuritiba, would you be able to respond? Thank you. Kuritiba, would you like to respond? Okay. Um, Argentina and Brazil doesn't have, I don't quite know what interactions the, do we have, but Paraguay in, in Brazil has association with the type of hydroelectrics that is cultivating good water, and they try to manage this wastewater on this wastewater, the water in general, on the Uso River. Thank you, and there's uh, one other question. Oh, if nothing is done, we will have to manage to find different water supplies, and the river, well, will be all degraded together with all its biodiversity, and all the biodiversity near the river that is um, actually aquatic. Thank you very much. Uh, Saskatchewan posed one question on the chat, which he did respond to, but did you have any other questions, Saskatchewan? Hi, we were also wondering about the amount of urban runoff, so about how much effect is affecting the river. Could you please type your question into the chat box, Saskatchewan? Thank you. We do have some runoff and it affects a lot, but we don't have control on river water on the runoff. Okay, thank you. Uh, let's see. Grand Rapids, do we have any questions here? Yes, come on up, thank you. Uh, we have a question we'll be posing. Uh, we'll type it into the chat box at this time. Great, let's see it. Okay, go ahead and ask. Yep, speak right into the mic, go ahead. Are there any associations that protect the rivers? And what do they do to help them? Kuritiba, can you see the question? We have posed it in the chat box. 
Okay, so we have some watershed committees that make action plans to protect the rivers. Uh, and the democratic process. Democratic process, very good. Thank you very much. Uh, we have one more question here for you from Grand Rapids. All right, Tavon. Okay. How about I'll say that you would recommend? No, we'll come stand next to me. Okay, so the, Tavon has a question, is, and that is, what are some pro proposals that you would recommend? Okay, so we should intensify the develop of innovative technologies to treat those rivers and all the pollution that we generate, and of course, together with education of the population. Could you repeat the answer? Uh, we should intensify the development of innovative technologies to treat the, the rivers, and of course, this together with education of population. New technologies to treat the water and education. Thank you. That came through very clearly. Thank you very much. Okay. At this time, uh, we'd like to thank you for your presentation. A round of applause for Curitiba, Brazil. Wonderful. At this time, we'll have a technology reset, and uh, Kirkrade will be presenting next. Uh, Kirkrade, we will be uh, giving you control of the slides. You will be able to advance your slides with the arrow buttons in the upper right-hand corner of the presentation screen. Uh, we are from uh, the Netherlands, and uh, okay. And, and the first slide will give you some general information about Holland. So, first slide. Okay. Uh, in uh, the Netherlands, we have uh, over 16 million uh, inhabitants. Uh, we uh, uh, 41,000 uh, square kil kilom kilometers. Uh, of ground is on. Uh, we are a country of windmills, tulips, and clocks. 27% uh, beneath sea level, that's uh, a lot. Uh, and uh, the largest part of uh, the, the we, we, lie, we lay on the North Sea. So uh, I'm going to give the word to someone else. <laughs> and they are going to tell you something about in the North Sea flood, the same. Hello, I'm Seth Swanevogel, and I'm going to tell you something about uh, the North Sea flood. Uh, the North Sea flood is one of the major uh, disasters in the Dutch history. It happened in 1953, and uh, enormous parts of uh, the Netherlands were, were uh, uh, flooded, and uh, almost 2,000 uh, people died. Um, this is why uh, the Netherlands has such a large research on water uh, projects, uh, so uh, this will never happen again. Uh, now uh, uh, someone else will tell you something about dikes. Hello, I'm going to talk about dikes. Um, when you look at my sheet, you can see that more than half of the, of the surface of our country is below the sea level. Uh, because of that, we started with uh, building uh, dikes around the year 1000. 
at the rivers and coastal areas to protect us against floods and to gain new land. The first dikes that um, they built were totally unstable and were washed away by the storm with high water. But we, as Dutch people, never give up and have built dikes firm and firm. So at the end of the Middle Ages, the dikes were strong enough to resist the most heavy storms um, with high water. So more and more land was retained due to the uh, construction of dikes. Nowadays, we have two types of dikes uh, in the Netherlands, primary dikes and secondary dikes. The primary dikes protect us against open water and uh, large rivers. We have two types of primary dikes, namely sea dikes and river dikes. The secondary dikes protect us against <coughs> inner waters. In the Netherlands, we have a department called Hydraterstaat, which is responsible for checking our dikes. And every six years, Hydraterstaat checks um, how high the water in the large rivers can come on, uh, based on the most recent insights. The Dutch Water Board checks the dikes for being high and strong enough for this extremely high water. This gives us a safe feeling for living here without the fear of becoming flooded. So we need to continue the presentation. <laughs> Uh, hello, it's me again. Uh, so, uh, I'm going to tell you something about uh, the enclosure dam. Uh, in Dutch, it's called uh, the Afsluitdijk. Um, it's uh, a large dam between uh, North Holland and uh, Friesland. Those are two provinces of the Netherlands. Uh, it is called a dike in Dutch, but uh, this term, uh, this word is actually incorrect because a dike is uh, on land and uh, this uh, enclosure dam was built to uh, to make a lake of the southern sea uh, which is now an internal water in uh, uh, which you can see in uh, the picture uh, it was built in 1931 uh, to uh, to secure uh, the parts uh, inside inside uh, the country that uh, there uh, would, wouldn't be any floods anymore and that uh, the people would be safer. Um, because of uh, the dam, the southern sea became a lake, so uh, the salt water also became fresh. Um, and there wasn't a tide. Um, this makes uh, the entire country uh, a lot more safe uh, because there isn't any uh, uh, chance on a flood anymore. Now something, someone will tell you about a, a new su a subject. <laughs> Hello, I'm Sandy. I'm going to tell you about polar. Um, a polar is a, 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 a small stuck, a stuck of land. Peace. <laughs> Peace, sorry. Um, first was this water, but uh, they pumped it um, empty and now you can live on it. Mm -hmm. Um, and a polar must, uh, must all the time be pumped because it's not natural that here is land. So water will come back every time. Uh, in the Netherlands we do have a lot of polars, well, uh, 3,000 polars. Um, the half of the total surface area of polars in Northwest Europe is in the Netherlands. A polar is always beneath sea level. Uh, so there must be some dikes or dams, otherwise it will flood. Um, the wall the west of the Netherlands is one big polar area. Uh, without dikes and dams, um, Netherlands was a lot smaller. Uh, a polar can you make over sea, a lake, a river, or something else with water. 
Um, one problem is the salt water, uh, salt water, the, the salt will remain in the, in the ground while you're pumping the uh, water away. And that's why the ground is very unuseful for uh, agriculture. <laughs> um, our biggest uh, pull is Flevoland. Um, Flevoland is one uh, province from the Netherlands. It is made of three little, uh, smaller polders. The northeast polder, the eastern Flevoland, and the southern Flevoland. Uh, Flevoland is the biggest island that is made by people. Before they could, could make Flevoland, they had to make the Afsluitberg. Um, the Southern Sea became a lake, and now it was much more easier for us to make uh, land. Um, Flevoland, uh, they made Flevoland because over the years, the Netherlands did a lot of um, land, and it was now a solution to make some land extra in the Netherlands. Um, now, another person is going to tell you something about the Delta Works. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. mm -hmm. I'm going to tell you something about uh, the Delta Works. After the Great Flood in, ni in 1953, we have decided we never want something like that again. So. There were two um, options, or we could make all our, di our dikes stronger and bigger, or we make our coastline shorter. We decided to do the last one, and so we came up with the Delta Plan. It's invented by Johan van Veen. Um, it has four more uh, main points which I like to explain. Which I like to explain. Uh, at first, they uh, started with the smallest project. It's called the Schouwer Duivelandse Dijk. Uh, which they um, make a dike to close one uh, one bit. You can see it on the map I put in the slide. Uh, with experience, yeah. with the experience gain in this project, they could build the bigger project. The second thing they done was close the tidal inlands. We have three main tidal inlands in the province, uh, Zeeland, which we which they were closing. It was necessary because. There were a lot of people, lots of people living there. There was a lot of uh, agriculture, and they, um, this way they could uh, enclose it. They had to need to build seven dams and dikes to uh, to see this through. Um, the coastline of Zeeland, the province where it was built, shrank from 700 kilometers to roughly 80 kilometers. Um, the uh, fourth project was closing the Dutch Isel. It's a big river, but the problem with this was it leads to the harbor of Rotterdam, which is one of the biggest harbors in the world. So they had to make a very special dike, which I want to explain closer in another slide. The last project was um, the Free Island Project. On account of this, of this project, the coastline of these three islands shrank with 50 kilom kilometers, and the three islands became connected with dikes. Um, and now I would like to tell you something about two embankments. At first, I would like to tell you something about the Herring Fleet Dam. This dam was built in 1970. Um, this dam uh, separates the North Sea from Herring Fleet. The dam is five kilometers long, and there is a there is a, a highway on top of it. It has a, lo a great lock complex with a slice gate, so ships can go from one side to another. The complex is about 100 meters wide. These locks need to make sure that the water comes from the Maas and Rhine, the two biggest rivers in Holland, find its way to the sea. There's one uh, significant change in the flora and fauna. The water that flowed in Haringvliet was salt before the dam was placed, but after it, it became fresh. This, was what, this had a great effect on the fish industry because a lot of salt water fish disappeared. But there came a lot more opportunities for recreation activities. The second embankment I would like to tell you something about is the Maaslandskering. It was built in 1979. The Maaslandskering was the last project of the Delta Works. It was a very interesting project because they couldn't close the whole waterway because that way the, the way to the dockyard of Amsterdam would be closed and it would be a financial disaster for Holland. But it was necessary to close this because 
because they couldn't build dikes along the whole waterway. It was too expensive and there was not enough room because in that area, it's a living area and an industrial area, one and a half million people lived there. So they decided to make a dike that, was, uh, that they could uh, close when needed and other ways would be on land. It's just like a bit in the London Thames, but then much bigger. You see it on the picture. Um, there are two very large gates, which they can move into the water when necessary. Um, there is a system that controls this. Um, it's called BOS. When the water level reaches 2.6 two meters above sea level, the uh, closing procedure is started, and when it does, the level doesn't drop but rises until 3 meters, the doors will close. Um, they, were, they, are pulled, they are pumped into the sea with an uh, oil press motor and the very difficult was um, the doors need to go horizontal and, ver and uh, up and down so they needed to have very very big um, ball bearings. They were so big that one ball had a diameter of 10 meters. This was one, only one um, factory in the world could build this. Uh, uh, ball bearings so great and so preci and precise enough that the uh, company Skoda made it for us and it's uh, driven by uh, oil pressure oil pressure motors this is the largest and final project of the Delta Works thank you for your attention good afternoon or good morning at your side of the ocean um, I hope my uh, colleagues have given you a good idea about what um, there has been a technical problem um, somebody else is going to tell you something. <laughs> <laughs> hello um, I'm going to tell you something about water treatment we have two ways of water treatment in Holland uh, one for sewage water and one for water to drink. Uh, to, to exonerate sewage water, because otherwise waste com comes in the ecosystems, uh, and that can be very, uh, that can be, uh, can cause very serious trouble uh, for nature, animal, and people. Uh, well, that's why we uh, exonerate sewage water. Uh, the the purification process is divided into several steps. Uh, primary uh, aimed at removal of particles based on their size. Uh, secondary uh, treatment uh, is biological treatment aimed on the removal of organic substances. Uh, tertiary uh, treatment, uh, uh, also bi biological treatment aimed on removal of uh, nu nutrients. Uh, quaternary treatment aimed on removal of uh, specific substances. Uh, we also exonerate surface water uh, because natural uh, purification is not uh, purificating enough. <laughs> Our drinking water uh, comes from uh, groundwater for 60%, uh, from water out, out rev uh, from rivers, uh, 39%, and from water uh, out of the dunes, 1%. That's what I'm going to tell you. Was uh, that's what I was going to tell you about uh, water treatment? And now uh, my friend Ingo is going to tell you something about. Uh, we have to. Um, as I already said, um, I hope my uh, colleagues have made a good impression of what is happening in within the Netherlands uh, with uh, correlations to water. Um, but what do we have to offer on an international level? Um, we have a great knowledge of everything to do with water and we are uh, hoping that uh, you are uh, you would want to receive that knowledge in events like uh, this conference or symposia or uh, we will come to you. Uh, or we will come to you to, tell, to teach you all these uh, fine arts uh, in, uh, to do with water. Um, there are other ways to do uh, to contribute to, to on an international level with uh, water, uh, like uh, supporting existing projects. I have heard uh, many projects in, only in this conference uh, even. And we could support 
suppose, with all the knowledge we have, or we could start new initiatives where you have problems and we do not, and you uh, don't, you haven't already started a, a project, so we could start a new initiative there. Or, uh, because the Netherlands is a quite a wealthy uh, uh, country, we could get some financial support. Um, I'm going to wrap it up for the Netherlands in this conference. Uh, I hope you enjoyed the presentation. Uh, and I, we are glad to answer all your questions. Thank you very much. It was very well done. How about a round of applause for Kirk Rade? Okay, so first uh, up for questions is Saskatchewan. Saskatchewan did post some questions in the chat box. Uh, so if uh, Saskatchewan, if we could see their uh, questions in the chat box, we might have to scroll up. And uh, if Saskatchewan, you'd like to read your questions out loud, uh, please turn on your microphone and pose your questions. We have two questions again. How does the new fresh water, water lake affect saltwater organisms that existed there before the dam was created? And we have another question too. How would the rise of, uh, how would the rise of sea level due to global warming affect the Netherlands? Uh, I would like to uh, first answer the first question. Um, there are a lot of species uh, of saltwater fish that disappeared in the areas that became fresh, especially eels. But um, we had no choice, or we would close it and protect ourselves, or we would leave it open and protect the animals, but that way we, as human beings, um, would take a very big risk to have fresh. To answer your second question, uh, the rise of the sea level is a big pro is a big problem for us because when the sea level rises, more of our lands become under sea uh, become under the sea level. That means we have to make our dikes bigger and stronger, and that's why we have the Krijswaterstaat to control the sea level and river the le water level water levels in the river to make sure the uh, the dikes won't break and uh, it won't we won't be flooded. Thank you very much. We have a question here in Grand Rapids for you. Uh, we'll pose the question, and while they read the question, I will type it in the chat box. Do the dikes keep most water from getting into the land? Has there been a really bad occasion when there was a lot of flooding? Okay, you'll see the question in the chat box now, Kirkrade. I put that right in line. Do the dikes keep most water out, or have there been recent severe floods? Yeah, um, the dikes uh, are very are very well. They keep most of the water out. If we have any have had any severe floods the last year, I would say no. But there are several small places around the big rivers in, in Holland that will um, flood that will flood once in a while. We have here in the neighborhood um, Itteren, that place once in two years uh, is, bla is blank. So yes, we have some floods, but no 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 severe floods anymore. Thank you. Uh, next. For questions is Medellin, Colombia. Medellin, uh, we see that you did post some questions in the chat box already. Uh, Medellin, please turn on your microphone. You can pose your question. Yeah, we have two questions. The first one is how have the dikes affected sea life? And the second one is how 
How has the creation of folders affected or polluted water in Levantine? It's on the chat box. I would uh, like to answer the first question first. Um, how have the dikes affected uh, uh, sea life? Uh, well, dikes are built on land, so uh, they don't immediately affect uh, the sea life. And the second question, um, most dikes, uh, most polders have been created uh, over centuries ago, uh, um, and they uh, then they were built with uh, without any chemical uh, uh, tools, so uh, they. <coughs> Hasn't polluted uh, the water. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Curitiba, Brazil. You are uh, able to pose questions now. If Curitiba has any questions, you can please turn on your microphone and type the question in the chat box. Yes, Ryan, thank you. We do have two questions. The first, we typed it actually, uh, how do you manage to change uh, ecosystems or, the, or how do you manage the change in ecosystems such as uh, species interactions when you change the landscape as you do through deconstructions or eye formations? And our second question would be, um, would be? It would be from Priscilla Brenton, um, and that's about um, the hostels that are boats or people that are living um, on boats, and how the government take care of the sewers of these places. Thank you. Could you hear me? Yes. Yes. Um, to answer the first, okay. to answer the first question, in Holland we have a policy to, uh, to for the ecosystem. But we take away in the sea, we make sure there comes new life uh, on the polders on Earth, so we so we can have we have uh, more mussel farms now. We have um, extra bird species in our polders. We have uh, more cows, more uh, what is it? Uh, uh, livestock. Um, so that way we keep it in, we keep it in balance. That's all. That's also um, one part of the job of the Rijkswaterstaat. Mm -hmm. And to answer the second question, it's very strong regulated. You first have to clean the sewage water. There's the people living on boats. You first have to clean the sewage water before they may dump the water into the rivers and into the sea. Um, yeah. Uh, if the sound is very bad, we can type the answers if you want. We heard you clearly. You guys could hear it? Yeah, it's definitely. Uh, we are typing the answers. Thank you. Curitiba, did you have any other questions for Kurkrade? Any other questions from Curitiba? Right, we don't have further questions. Those are those are the questions. Um, if it's too inconvenient, maybe we they could type and send to us later. Uh, whatever you feel better. It's very hard to hear um, anything from from this side here. Thank you. Uh, okay, I believe uh, Kirkrade is typing the answers, so you should look for them in the chat box. Uh, let's give a big round of applause for Kirkrade. Thank you very much. Okay, at this time, uh, our, f our final presenting group online today is the Luther College International Baccalaureate High School in Regina, Saskatchewan, Canada. So, uh, Saskatchewan, you should have control of your slides. You can advance those slides uh, with the arrow buttons in the upper right-hand corner. Please let us know if you have any difficulty with that. We're from Luther College, and today 
we're here to talk with you oh, okay, no. about our watershed in Saskatchewan, and that's right there in the middle of Canada. You can see it up on the screen. And there's a little green arrow there, if you can see it. It's really tough to see. I can't see it either. Oh. And we're part of a large watershed that outgoes into Hudson Bay called the Nelson Watershed. It's seen in yellow on the screen. And all of our water in Oscana flows with the Pell River, which flows into Lake Winnipeg, out the Nelson River into Hudson Bay and the Atlantic Ocean. Wascana Creek watershed is quite small compared to most watersheds. Most of the water we get here comes from the snow melt and rain. And we're very unique because other watersheds usually have their water source in the mountains. And without man-made lakes here in Regina and the sewage treatment plant, the creek, the creek would likely go dry during the summer. In the winter, actually, about 100% of our water comes from the sewage creek or flowing water comes from the sewage treatment plant. Those are some pictures for us. Okay, and we'll talk about some economic effects on the Los Cannon Creek watershed. This is in the right Okay. It's also responsible for an overall decline in creek nutrient retention deficiency. That would be referring to, what is it referring to? Yeah, the treatment plant. Yeah, it's referring to the sewage treatment plant. And we get most of our irrigation from here to Lumsden, you said, right? Is, or is from the like, <coughs> Creek watershed. And the sewage treatment plant here in Regina causes a higher concentration of nitrate and phosphorus in the creek, which which is causing problems for the creek area. We have, speaking of economic now, we have most of our economy comes from agriculture here in Saskatchewan. And Washington Creek has one of the highest densities of pesticide licenses and highest intensities of pesticide use in Saskatchewan. What that means is that within the Wascana Creek watershed, there's a large number of licenses issued for pesticide use for agriculture. And we know there's a high intensity of use in those areas because more money is spent on the pesticides per hectare, about 90, 70 to 90 dollars. And with massive increases in recent years, when I say that, it really is quite a lot of people for our area. In the years from 2006 to 2011, the population in Regina alone, our city, increased 65,000 people. And that doesn't seem like a lot, but in a city of 200,000, that's quite a bit, actually. <laughs> and this is causing huge stress on the sewage treatment plant, and the increases in urban urbanization are really creating problems for it to handle all of the sewage coming in. And the concentrations of nitrogen are really high in the creek right now, and sometimes they render the water undrinkable. Okay, pass me off. So um, a couple of years ago, Environment Canada released a report that was kept quiet, but um, recently, this um, news, like the news, found out about the story and we made the story public through the through the media. Which, which made a which made people realize the problem a lot more than it has in the past. Which leads to the next point, like if people were to know more about the problem, which they don't really that much, um, people might be feel ob obligated to change more and to work in order to to fight the problem. And another suggestion could be to mitigate pollution at the source. For example, homes, golf courses, and farming. So maybe use less fertilizer than we have in the past or flushing down less less chemicals than we do now. 
um, small scale, small scale awareness could be we could have a, a an economic plan called low impact development, which is basically an engineering plan that helps keep storm water um, at the source so it doesn't flow and collect a bunch of bunch of um, runoff from from collecting nitrates and putting it into the watershed, but rather to keep it where keep the water where it came from in the first place. And basically another thing is just to be a good influence. So some social aspects. There's an increase in algae growth because of the sewage treatment plant. So when the sewage treatment plant is releasing its water back into the creek after it's been cleansed, there's still nitrogen and phosphates that are entering the creek. And this leads to an increase in algae growth, which affects the biotic components in that creek. So because of this increase in phosphates and nitrates, the fish lower down in the, in the, in the stream, further down, closer to the Hudson Bay, are uneatable because of the increase in toxins as they build up throughout the tropic level. And this means that there's less fish to eat lower down the stream. And Saskatchewan uses a lot of the water from this creek as irrigation in the market garden. And look further down the stream, as I said before, this algae that has been developed through the stream is unable to be used as irrigation. And it's more difficult because pipes and stuff can clog up because of the algae, and it makes it more difficult to use in these market gardens. All right, so there are a good deal of golf courses that exist along the watershed between Regina and London, and this contributes to a lot of the runoff of fertilizer and pesticides and stuff that gets into our water. And since it is such a small uh, stream, these really collect and they get quite dense with pesticides and chemicals. Um, upstream of Regina, there's cereal crops that dominate the watershed, which again uh, contributes to more pesticide use and a lot of the industrial chemicals used on the crops uh, pollute the water even further. The Regina treatment plant is downstream of Regina, and as Brendan said before, in the wintertime almost 100% of the water flow through the Wolfgana Creek is go through the treatment plant. Um, Peter Levitt, a uh, researcher at the University of Regina, is said to believe that the creeks are the most polluted in Canada, if not the world. And even though it does, most of the water does go through the sewage treatment plant, and we do have a pretty advanced system for that, obviously it does not get out enough chemicals uh, for it to be sustainable. Uh, and yeah, the majority of the water runs through the treatment plant and the city of Regina. And yeah, also non point source pollution like run off the roads and litter often end up in the water. Okay, so I'd just like to clarify one thing. We actually our sewage treatment plant does try to take out a lot of the nitrogen and phosphorus. Uh, do a tertiary treatment. So, but still, due to quality agricultural and non point source pollution, there is a large uh, amount of nitrogen and phosphorus uh, downstream of the sewage treatment plant. So, primary productivity and a decrease in bacterial production was noted uh, downstream also of the sewage treatment plant. <laughs> And also an increase in nitrogen and phosphorus, so that's probably due to agriculture. Uh, there's also a large nitrogen hypersaturation, which means that the water is exceeding the criteria that Canada and the USA has set. And this often leads, uh, actually can be toxic to organisms in a stream such as fish. Uh, very few fish, especially in the spring and summer, are downstream due to these high nitrogen levels and also uh, the temperature of the creek. Uh, there's also an increase in algal biomass because of the nutri uh, nutrients 
in the stream. Uh, they're not limiting factors because there's so much nitrogen in the stream. There's also a switch due to the uh, lower primary productivity from autotrophy, so primary producers, to heterotrophy, meaning like low or higher level uh, trophic levels, so like fish and food, things like that. Um, and toxins also bioaccumulate in the organism, so fish. Um, toxins can include anything that is flushed and anything so that's pharmaceutical like ibuprofen. Uh, and high levels of this, the potential <coughs> ibuprofen can inhibit uh, feeding and movement of organisms like fish and other types of aquatic life. Here is a cultural impact. Wisgana uh, watershed runs through every cultural land. Uh, since Saskatchewan <laughs> has a farming culture, the farmers <laughs> use fertilizers, uh, use fertilizers uh, and other chemicals on their land, uh, which later runs off into the creek and course and course fusion. Uh, with Gannon Creek, it also used as for park and for recreation, which may cause some more damage to the water. So a large percentage of the population in Saskatchewan is First Nation. Uh, the First Nations religion the values of nature. And so they want to do that. Okay. Uh, and uh, there's some First Nation reserves that uh, around the water waves and the First Nations communities uh, share the responsibility for certain water in the So in conclusion, the sewage treatment plant that is down here from Regina is having negative um, impact on the Nelson watershed. There's a lot of fertilizer runoff that affects the water and the tropic levels downstream because the Saskatchewan is such an agriculturally run province in Canada. And this fertilizer runoff and the sewage treatment plants are having negative effects on the organism because the toxins will build up throughout the tropic levels. The water in the creek is often used as irrigation for market gardens and with the algae growth that is increasing because of the different um, phosphates and nitrogen that are entering the water, it's more difficult to irrigate with this water. And public awareness and changes in lifestyle are, are beginning to make a difference, but there's still not enough being done to change this problem. Okay, thank you very much, Saskatchewan. Let's give a round of applause for Regina Luther College. Uh, let's see, a couple updates. I see that Lima, Peru has joined the session. Uh, Lima, do you have any questions for Luther College in Saskatchewan? If so, please turn on your microphone and pose the question. Let's see, we'll come back to you. Uh, in Grand Rapids, do we have any questions that we would like to pose for Luther College in Saskatchewan? Yes, we do have a question. We will type it in the chat box uh, while we read the question out loud as well. What community initiatives has your local community began in order to address the problems that the, that is, um, being shown in your local community. Our 
right? And so there really isn't a great deal of uh, community knowledge or awareness of the problem because the river is so small to run through our city. So basically the only real thing we've done to try and clean up the river has been to update our sewage treatment plant. And yeah, that's happening continuously right now. So I, one, the other question is re regarding the hypersaturation of nitrogen. Are there any attempts for the nitrogen uh, to be removed from the watershed after the water treatment plant? I'm assuming the nitrogen comes from uh, non-point agricultural pollution, but uh, what can be done to remove the nitrogen? There actually aren't many, or well, there's nothing actually that is downstream of the sewage treatment plant to uh, remove the nitrogen. Sounds like a, a project for you guys to, uh, to study perhaps, huh? Uh, let's see, thank you very much for answering the question. Uh, Medellin has posted a question, I believe, in the chat box. Medellin, if you'd like to turn on your microphone and pose the question, please do so. Yes, we have one. How did so much ibuprofen reach the water, and which side effects do the pesticides have on the water in terms of human health? Can you see the question? Oh, the ibuprofen uh, is due to domestic waste, so uh, wash from houses and things like that. And so that includes any pharmaceutical pills, uh, antibiotics, that have been uh, from Not only that, but the exposure to PPCPs, which is pharmaceuticals and personal care products, in the Los Angeles watershed is actually at a level where everything, like all the organisms in the watershed, are exposed to that continually. And research has actually, it's never been tested before, or it's never been experimented on, so we don't actually know what the effects of that all will be on the organisms in the watershed. Thank you. Curitiba, Brazil, uh, did you guys have any questions for Luther College in Saskatchewan? If so, please turn on your microphone, pose the question, and type it in the chat box. Hi, Ryan, thank you. Yes, we have a question. Uh, the question is, do you have ways to treat the pollution from pesticides, and what are the ways? Thank you. Currently, there is nothing being done to remove the pollution from pesticides to go into the water. <clears throat> and so, um, concentrations, well, the concentration is quite large, especially considering the small size of the creek. So nothing right now. Thank you very much. Uh, let's see, Kirkrade, did you guys have any questions for Luther College in Saskatchewan? If so, uh, please pose your question and type it in the chat box. Uh, we are having two questions. First question is, do you have any national or regional authority which checks and controls the pollution of the water? And the second question is, do these problems affect your economy? Okay, uh, the province of Saskatchewan has regulations set for um, treatment of water and the water treatment plant here in Regina actually exceeds many of the set regulations uh, but due to all the agricultural runoff and also possibly because of things not um, being seen or working at the water treatment plant there is still a lot of Kind of and such to get in the 
ask the second question again. Kukrade, does that answer your questions? Thank you. Thank, Thank you very much. much. Thank you. Let's give another round of applause to Luther College in Regina, Saskatchewan. Well, uh, we did see that Lima, Peru did join the conversation. We will see if Lima has anything that they would like to present to us. Uh, if not, then we'll proceed with closing comments. Lima, are you there? show up but they're not they're not active okay okay at this time uh, we will go ahead with closing comments uh, I will have a few comments and then uh, we also have uh, some comments from the mayor of Grand Rapids George Hartwell so I would like to give a huge huge thanks to all the participants obviously this is the first time we've done this we hope that we can offer this same conference again next year uh, but with this being the first attempt uh, there was a lot of uh, flexibility and creativity that went into the process and I just want to thank everybody uh, for being flexible and coming up with such innovative presentations and uh, and sharing in the dialogue so thank you Uh, also, students, uh, there will be a certificate of participation for all students we will be sending out. Uh, so if uh, coordinators at each site could make sure that all student names uh, are emailed to me, I will make sure that the certificates are uh, sent out. Uh, again, we are also encouraging the continuation of this dialogue and global connectivity for students and teachers. Uh, we have a Facebook page titled Youth Virtual Conference of the UNURCEs. If you look for that Facebook group, students who presented today and coordinators at each site, if you would join that group, uh, you'll be able to stay uh, connected and be able to continually use the Blackboard site license as well for other conference uh, uh, possibilities that can be arranged site to site. Uh, so with that, I'd like to welcome up Mayor George Hartwell for some closing comments uh, from Grand Rapids, Michigan. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Well, thank you, Mr. Huppert. All right, well, let, let me then make some closing remarks to, uh, to you students here in Grand Rapids and to the students of the, of the world. Um, this has been the most remarkable uh, educational experience to bring the world together, three continents together uh, here uh, uh, to for peer education. You have been the teachers teaching each other, uh, sharing the knowledge, sharing the research uh, that, that you've done uh, in, in these uh, six cities. So I want to first of all congratulate you and thank you for a remarkable uh, day of education. I'd also like to thank uh, Mr. Huppert and, and all of the people who are behind the scenes here that you can't see on your, uh, on your camera angles uh, uh, who have been making this conference work, the technicians that we've been working with uh, for, for uh, uh, months now to make sure that this conference worked very well. Uh, and I know that's true in each of the sites. Uh, you have people who have been working with our technicians in Grand Rapids. Thank you all for the work that you've done to make this a successful conference today. Uh, finally, let me conclude by saying that today the world became a bit smaller. Uh, today the world became a bit safer. Today the world the world's environment became a bit richer because of this learning experience and this sharing of ideas among students from around the world. Um, from students in, uh, in Kirkrade in, in the Netherlands, uh, students in Curitiba, uh, stu students in, um, in Saskatchewan, uh, students in Bolivia, uh, in Medellin, 
uh, students here in Grand Rapids and the students who will soon join uh, and be um, auditing this session uh, in Lima, Peru. Uh, uh, you all are remarkable. Uh, the quality of the presentations that we heard today uh, and that you shared with each other from all around the world um, are, are truly, truly uh, awesome pieces of work. And I want to be the first to congratulate you uh, on, uh, on exceptional uh, academic scholarship that you've, uh, you've provided today. I look forward to us doing this again next year. Um, you students around the world and students here in Grand Rapids can know that in each of your communities there is an organization chartered by the United Nations called a Regional Center for Expertise on Education for Sustainable Development. Uh, uh, in Grand Rapids, we have, uh, we have one of these regional centers, and it's, and it's our regional center that helped to organize this, working with the centers in each of the other uh, five cities. So I'd like for you to encourage you, students, to connect with your United Nations Regional Center for Expertise in Education for Sustainable Development. Together, we can be stronger. Together, we can be more powerful. Together, we can be a, a better globe. Uh, thank you, thank you very much for joining us today. Okay. So in, in closure, uh, please log on to the Facebook page, students who participated, uh, teachers, coordinators at the sites. If you could join our Youth Virtual Conference Facebook page, we can stay connected that way. And uh, we look forward to next year. Again, thank you all.